Okay, class, this is our Chapter 5 slideshow on biodiversity, more specifically the evolution of biodiversity, how does evolution lead to having different species, and then eventually leading us to our discussion of why biodiversity is so important. Case study that the book gives you in Chapter 5 is, you know, uh, funnily enough called the dung of the devil, which is an actual plant, a uh, plant root that has antiviral properties. It was first discovered uh, during the Spanish flu epidemic of around 1920. Now, those of you that don't know, Spanish flu uh, claimed anywhere between 20 and 100 million people, which is a massive number when you think about it, especially over 100 years ago. Now, Spanish flu was an H1N1 variant, which should sound familiar because when we went through the swine flu epidemic, that was also an H1N1 variant. It was a variant of that virus. Now, dung of the devil had been shown to have antiviral properties after it had been cooked and used and on uh, individuals. Uh, so once the uh, swine flu epidemic came out and the information came out that it was also an, an H1N1 variant, uh, it was basically resurfaced that this plant had this that had these antiviral properties to fight the swine flu uh, was actually being used in areas and shown uh, to be more effective than some of the vaccines were. Uh, why this is important is when we talk about biodiversity, we talk about having a, just a large array of different species on this planet. And one of the things that's actually important uh, in the name of biodiversity and why we care so much about having biodiversity is that we really don't know how helpful or useful some of these species are. It's estimated that only about 3% of all plant species have been tested for medical properties as of today. 3%. So when we have a large variety of plants, it's very possible that since it's been shown that they have this medical efficacy to them, that they do help, uh, that's very important that we keep a large array and having a large array of different plant life is very important because who knows what could possibly happen in terms of our um, need for medical use when it comes to these different species of plants. So talking about biodiversity, there are various levels of diversity. The one we're going to be focusing on more of is going to be species diversity, you know, having different variety of species in an ecosystem. That's going to be our lab when we study the Shannon Wiener Index. Um, all of it does begin with genetic diversity, and we'll talk about that again, you know, kind of alluding to a review of natural selection. Uh, so here when we talk about ecosystem diversity, we're talking about having all of those ecosystems here. So we see our ocean, our coastal line, our river that leads out to it in the basin here, forested area, mountainous area with snow caps. These are all various ecosystems where we can find different species of living things here. Species diversity is more about how many different species are in a particular area in an ecosystem. And then genetic diversity, meaning within that one species, we have all of these different genes or these possible different genes that could lead to different traits for that one species of organism. Now, our lab on biodiversity is going to look at these two things here. When we talk about species diversity, we're talking about species richness, which is just the number of species in a given area. You know, something as simple as 10 species, 15, 20 different species in a particular area that we're studying here. Species, species evenness is a measure of whether a particular ecosystem is dominated by one species or are all individuals represented by similar numbers. It's an evenness is an important thing because if you don't have a lot of evenness, that means that something that disrupts that larger, more predominant species could have a much more, a much larger ripple effect on that ecosystem. Having a more even species like community one here means that if something happens, some disease takes out species A, we still have a large amount of plant life making up this community. However, in community number two, if something were to affect species A, that would wipe out 70% of the species of the uh, species here, 70% of the population here, because they all happen to be one species. It's not very good evenness. It's very difficult to bounce back from something like that. Uh, in terms of overall ecosystem health. Now what leads to this biodiversity is a review of evolution. Evolution just being this change of, in genetic composition over time, whether it is individual mutations like in microevolution or what we're more commonly uh, figure which is macroevolution where uh, adaptations lead to new species because certain traits survive and are passed on long enough 
uh, that they eventually become a staple and eventually differentiate one population from another to the point that they become brand new species. So your quick genetics review, genes just being the place on the chromosome uh, where a particular characteristic is coded for. The genotype would be the set of genes. We usually represent these with you know, dominant and recessive, big A's, big capital letters and lowercase letters when we're representing them. Now, when talking about this genetic code, any kind of mutation would just be a random change in that genetic code, and mutations do lead to speciation. Uh, we'll talk about some cases where random, mut where random mutations do cause that. Uh, and then the phenotype is when these genes in this genotype are actually being expressed. So AA might be the genotype that codes for black fur, whereas little a, little a here, as opposed to big A, big A, is the genotype that codes for the phenotype of, let's say, white fur on a particular, particular animal. Now, evolution does occur by two means. One is artificial selection, and it's considered artificial because this is when humans themselves are determining what traits are passed on. So if you think about dogs uh, and the different dog breeds we have and breeders for any kind of animal or um, any kind of domesticated animal like a dog or a farm animal or crops, um, you know, we'll look at a graphic that shows that a lot of uh, staple vegetables that were that many have eaten things like cabbage and kale and um, Brussels sprouts uh, all originated from wild mustard plants. So you don't eat wild mustard, but all of these things that we are used to eating, a lot of these staple vegetables and crops uh, that some that a lot of us have eaten before are all descended from one individual plant. Just like all of these dog breeds are descended from modern from what we would still consider uh, a modern contemporary being a wolf. That's artificial. Artificial is not natural selection. Natural selection is when not humans, but the environment determines what traits are passed on. In artificial selection, people make that decision. In natural selection, it's the environmental pressures. It's the ability to survive and reproduce, right? That drive, that's, which, that's what leads to particular genes being passed on. So, when we talk about dog breeds, they're a good example of, and I promised you guys a picture of my dog. Dog breeds are a good example of not naturally selected, but artificially selected evolution. Natural selection functions by Darwin's theory, where individuals have multiple offspring, and not all offspring can survive, and the ones that do have some kind of ability, some adaptation, some trait that makes them better able to survive, or what we would call more fit. They have some trait that increases their fitness, and fitness is the higher fitness an organism has, the more likely that organism is to reproduce and have its own offspring. Uh, the example given here is with amphipods, so these little crustacean things. Uh, turns out that with these amphipods, this one particular species of amphipods, they're actually very small. And one of the reasons that, and the reason that they are small is because these smaller ones are less likely to be eaten. That trait of being small helps it avoid larger predators like its fish. Fish eat the bigger ones because they're easier to see. However, when you have the smaller ones present, smaller ones are able to survive long enough to pass on those genes, and since they survive long enough, those traits, that genes that are going to code for a smaller amphipod, smaller crustacean, are going to be the ones that are passed on within that species. Now, that's basically what natural selection is. Evolution can also occur by random processes, like mutations, and there are examples on the next slide you can take some time to look at uh, that all involve mice. But basically, all of these things can also lead to evolution for one reason or another. Mutation just being a random mutation creates a new gene, and if that gene gets passed on in that population, then all of a sudden you could eventually, you know, you have a new gene that is going to be passed on, which may or may not be more advantageous than a previous gene. Um, genetic drift is another possibility, which is basically uh, genetic composition over time, a gene basically drifts away. It doesn't completely fall out, but over time it drifts as a result of just random mating and, and, and breeding, where that gene just does not happen to be found anymore. Over time, it just gets um, washed away because it's unfavorable and it's just not seen anymore. The bottleneck effect is basically what happens when a population number is reduced uh, in size by so much 
that you basically only have what, what might have been a much wider array of genes for particular traits is now bottlenecked down to a very small amount, and that's the only ones we're going to see within that population. Um, this is something we see happening with cheetahs currently, and it's not, bottleneck effects are not good because bottleneck effects do not increase diversity of genes, and the more diverse genes are in a population, the uh, healthier that species is going to be overall because it's going to be able to survive different um, problems and troubles uh, in terms of survival, and just having a higher diversity of genes for particular traits uh, increases fitness of an overall species. The last one being a founder effect where you basically just have individuals that descend from a small number. So if you were to have a large uh, disturbance that only leaves a few individuals within a population from an otherwise larger gene pool, now those few individuals are going to repopulate the entire population. This is happening with uh, rhinos uh, currently and other hunted animals in that there are so many organisms that have been uh, wiped out of these populations that now a small number is basically all that was left to repopulate the entire uh, numbers for those species. And so because there were only a handful of individuals to do that with, those n individuals that are now surviving are all descended from and carry the genes from that limited population pool. So again, we'll go over this slide a little bit more in class, do some more examples for this, but it's basically just giving you some examples, some ideas of different ways that mutation, in the top one genetic drift, bottleneck effect, and founder effect are uh, able to change the genetic pop makeup of population. So since we don't have, this is a big slide, there's a lot of information, we'll go over this a little bit more in class in more detail. All right, so the change in genes can eventually lead to uh, some new species. And we could also have new species caused by or basically produced from different barriers, we'll call them. Uh, one of those barriers could be geographic or it could be reproductive, meaning that the physical barrier prevents populations from interbreeding and over time those two populations become new species. Uh, it could be reproductive isolation which could do with times of the year in terms of mating, or it could be in terms of uh, food sources. Uh, like we see here, uh, Darwin's finches that he's observed in the Galapagos Islands is an example of allopatric speciation. The barrier here being food, food sources, organisms that, finches that ate certain food sources were, ate, were found together, bred together, and uh, created these different species of finches all from an ancestral finch that migrated to the, migrated to the uh, that island not a single finch obviously but a species of finches and because of their food source led to all of these different organisms basically creating their own species <clears throat> because some of them were just better suited to eating certain foods they were better able to get energy from food sources those were the ones that survived um, and they were able to, from there, reproduce with other organisms that ate those same food sources. Another way that speciation occurs and leads to new species is called sympatric. This one is less common. It happens more with plants. It does happen with animals as well, but we don't see it too often as being beneficial with animals. It is very beneficial with more plant things. And this is basically when organisms can interbreed with each other, but something usually causes... Uh, a change in the number of chromosomes. Like with the example of wheat here, it was shown that once this original wheat plant doubled its set of chromosomes from two to four, which happened randomly, uh, it produced a stronger wheat plant, bigger seeds. And then that plant wouldn't pollinate with the original one. So then when this one would again produce seeds with more chromosomes and then for larger seeds we basically domesticated to the point where we went from two sets of chromosomes to four up to eight which is what our common wheat has and those extra chromosomes made were more desirable because they led to bigger seeds it was able to grow larger uh, and was much more beneficial <clears throat> pace of evolution is something we'll talk about a little bit more in class um, basically there are certain uh, effects that lead to 
uh, make it more desirable for a population, certain traits that we'll talk about in class a little bit more, and why we focus on and study speciation and evolution because uh, speciation leads to organisms basically finding a role in an ecosystem, what we call a niche, basically ideal conditions. And if an organism finds its ideal conditions and it's better at surviving than other organisms, then it itself is going to survive and pass on its genes and, you know, keep a, a foothold within that ecosystem. Organisms that are not as good at surviving are going to have a, that don't have uh, a fundamental niche are going to find it uh, tougher to survive. So within that fundamental niche, organisms can survive, grow, and reproduce. As we get further and further away, like this chart is demonstrating from that fundamental niche, some organisms are just barely able to survive. In this case, we're talking about ideal temperature. Outside of that ideal temperature range, it's uh, organisms are barely able to survive. Some are able to survive and grow, but not reproduce. But within that fundamental range of temperature, that ideal temperature range, organisms are able to survive, grow, and reproduce. So finding that niche is important in terms of reproduction and passing on those genes. So in terms of niches, uh, the realized niche is what we're basically going to say. These are the conditions that this, I'm sorry, these are the conditions that this organism lives in. Some organisms are generalist, meaning they can tolerate a wide range of conditions and still survive, grow, and reproduce under them. Some are specialists. Here we see the bug on the left here is a generalist. It can survive in a wide range of conditions because it eats a lot of different stuff. Our beetle on the right here, however, is a specialist. Only eats this one type of plant. So in this area, these two organisms, the beetle is going to be is better it's suited to survive. However, outside of this food source, the bug on the left is going to have a much better chance of surviving because the beetle is a specialist, whereas this is a generalist. Now, as we talk about speciation, we know that the number of species on this planet has changed over time. Um, we know this from looking at the fossil record that while we would expect that speciation would lead to just larger, larger number of species over time, we have seen dips in this. These dips are mass extinctions. The largest one occurred right here at about 250 million years, and its cause still remains unknown as to why this happened. We're really not sure. Uh, the one that you're most commonly familiar with is this one here about 60 million years ago. This is the asteroid that killed off the dinosaurs. So these things do happen for one reason, for unknown reasons, or in our case, reasons that we've been able to uncover, but they do happen. And the reason we bring this up is because currently we're going through what believe, scientists believe is our sixth mass extinction. Uh, and they feel that in the last two decades, uh, we've begun to lose biodiversity and lose species, and that by the end of this decade, 2020, estimates uh, could be anywhere from 2 to 25% of all species on the planet. To give you an idea, this one that wiped out the dinosaurs took out about 50% of all species. Uh, this one here that uh, in about 250 million years ago wiped out about 90% of all species on the planet. Now, in contrast to previous ones and why we care is that scientists are in pretty large agreement that the loss of species here is due to human activities. Destruction of land, pollution, climate change caused by human activities are all responsible for this current sixth mass extinction we are going through. All right, so that is our biodiversity. Uh, we'll see you in class to go over more of these notes and to go over more of this information in a little bit more detail.